Hi, uh, good evening everyone, and perhaps I should also greet you with the greetings of Islam, which is uh, may the peace of God be upon you all. And in Arabic, that is assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Um, certainly a very uh, colorful and very nice uh, introduction by Atif, and thank you. But, you know, if I step down from that very lofty position that he introduced me, um, I wanted to uh, share just a few thoughts, and really in, in a few words, uh, about some of the uh, many um, examples and situations of the past in which uh, people of different faith have always come together to assist each other at the hour of need. And uh, we see this, uh, for example, in the case of um, those Muslims who fled uh, Spain during the time of the Inquisition, the Jews who fled Spain also during the time of the Inquisition, and each one of them assuming new sort of um, names. Uh, the Muslims called themselves Morescos, and the Jews called themselves Morinos. And uh, these two groups would uh, move out of the Iberian Peninsula and then either went back to some of the uh, Muslim lands if they were Muslim. But uh, interestingly enough, uh, some of the Jews also went to the Muslim lands because they uh, found uh, certainly a refuge within Muslim lands. And that is why until today you will find there are pockets of Jews spread out uh, in northern Africa, for example, and in parts of the Middle East as well. You will find pockets of Jews in Yemen and places like that and so on. Matter of fact, I was in Yemen uh, about three years back, and I'm reminded of that moment I went to a store to buy some Yemeni jewelry. My wife, my wife wanted to buy some Yemeni jewelry, and later on I understood that a lot of the people who made Yemeni or traditional jewelry uh, were Yemeni Jews, actually. So in talking to uh, one of them, and I uh, just posed the question, I said, um, did you ever want to go back? Did you ever want to uh, return back to uh, Israel or, or some place like that? He, his answer was interesting. He said, no, I, I'm perfectly safe where I am. I like where I live. I'm very comfortable where I am. I have no problems here. I get along with the people I live with. Uh, there would be no reason for me to move out of here. This is my land and my home for centuries and for generations. And so it's interesting to hear a lot of uh, stories like that. Uh, but for whatever reasons people help uh, people of other faith, for whatever reasons it is, whether it is uh, because of just a human factor where we come in and help, or it is because our faith motivates us and drives us towards providing this shelter and serving the underserved and the underprivileged and those who are prosecuted, uh, Islam also has very interesting teachings about that, and I thought I'd just mention one or two of those teachings. And uh, one of the things that happened during the time of the Prophet, uh, to whom be peace, and the Prophet Muhammad, we believe in Islam, is the last of the messengers, to whom the uh, Quran, which is the final revelation, we believe, was revealed to, and then eventually from him to humanity. And so a lot of his practices and a lot of his sayings were captured as well as teachings. And in this particular instance, a funeral procession was passing in front of him, and the Prophet of Islam, to whom be peace, actually stood up. And as he did, his companions also stood up with him. But they did ask him the question. They said, O Messenger of Allah, this is the funeral procession of someone who was a Jew. And he said that whenever you see a funeral procession, you should stand up, meaning that you honor the funeral procession. So later on, his followers emulated that example, and a funeral procession were to pass in front of them later on, uh, elsewhere, and they did so. They stood up, and then w between themselves, they uh, narrated this incidents of what the prophet, uh, to whom be peace, had instructed them. And they narrated this particular wording. They said that the prophet actually, when he was told this was a Jewish person who was dead, he said, is it not a living being with a soul? Or isn't it a living soul? Meaning that, you know, our humanity binds us all. And so sometimes um, we need to uh, come to uh, some sort of an understanding about that. And then also the Quran, which is the book that Muslims believe is the last revelation of God. And so there is actually a chapter in the Quran known as Al-Maidah, which is a chapter when translated, it means the table spread. 
in this particular chapter, there is a verse, and this is verse number 32. It refers to the incidents that happened to the children of Adam. Initially, the initial progeny of Adam that actually fought the two brothers that fought and killed each other, one killed the other. And then it said that in this verse, then it would say, on that account, meaning on that particular incident, we ordained for the children of Israel that if any killed a person, unless it be for murder or for spreading mischief in the land, that there were reasons like those, it would be as if he killed the whole of humanity. And if anyone saved a life, it would be as if he saved the entire humanity. So Muslims took from this teaching that it was not only an instruction to the children of Israel, but it was an instruction to us all in general that we honor human life and that we always uh, work towards protecting human life and that human life is sacred, that the domain of uh, taking and giving life is that of God only, and that is uh, the Almighty, the creator of all of us. And there are many other teachings in the Quran, and I want to just conclude with this, which is there are many verses in the Quran that deal with the issue of justice in general. And in this, the Quran praises those who always act in the light of truth, which is what the verse says when translated. And it tells us, perfected are the words of your Lord in truth and justice. So it tells us, behold, God enjoins justice and good actions and generosity to our fellow human beings. So this act of generosity, as I was reading those uh, narratives uh, that were put on the wall next to those pictures, it obviously seems that the act of uh, justice, protecting what is right and what is true and standing with those who are suffering and being prosecuted, but at the same time being generous. They never wanted to be paid for those services. They never asked for any money that these acts of generosity, again, are captured in the teachings of Islam. And of course, uh, one can go on and on and pull a lot of other teachings in the Quran that refer us back to why we need to work towards helping the underserved, the underprivileged, and the persecuted, and to always stand for the truth and justice. But I just thought I'd share with you these few examples. And again, for whatever reason that we are driven to want to help the other, uh, with that verse in the Quran in conclusion that says that Khan and Nas, that the people, and Allah is referring in the Quran that the people are one, meaning that before the arrival of this separation of you are this and I'm that, and you're that color and I'm this color, you're that faith and I'm that faith, that the people are one, that the Adamic bond binds us all as human beings. And that is the thought that I want to leave you with. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Bin Hazim and Atip, very kind remarks. Um, my name is Shia Baer, and on behalf of the 32nd Annual Holocaust Lecture Series at Vanderbilt University, I want to thank you uh, to coming to our opening event for this program. Um, today we were supposed to also have the participation of Johanna Newman and Norman Gershman, uh, along with Stuart Hock, who is with us. Uh, unfortunately, they could not make it. They are not well. Uh, but they do send their regards. Um, you should have received a uh, brochure, and if you haven't, uh, there is a, uh, a collection of brochures at the, uh, at the front uh, table for the Holocaust Lecture Series. Our next program is going to be on October 20th at 7 p.m. It's a film called Bloodlines, uh, which uh, is a documentary dealing with the grandniece of Bettina Goering, who, uh, of, uh, who was the um, uh, grandniece, rather, of, um, of Hermann Goering, rather, and uh, in, in her dealings with a uh, daughter or a survivor. Uh, it seems like a very fascinating film. We hope you'll be there, and it will also have discussion following. And there will, you should also be receiving now evaluations, uh, if you'd be so kind at the close of the program to uh, complete those evaluations. And we hope that you'll consider joining our committee. Uh, we, we always look for participation from the Vanderbilt campus and the community at large. 
Uh, the image of Muslims has long been skewered in popular culture. We owe this partly to the long-standing antagonisms between Muslims and Jews through the lens of the Israeli-Arab conflict. And then, of course, there's the specter of the World Trade Center attacks on September 11th, 2001, which promoted heightened xenophobic response by the West regarding all things Muslim. Uh, this, this fear has followed us into the 2008 election when, the, when then candidate Barack Hussein Obama was in the pejorative sense commonly labeled a, co a covert Muslim by way of birth and education. The trepidation is still with us today to some extent and could easily, easily, easily be accelerated through any number of possible violent situations. This evening's program and the favorable, favorable international reception of the Bessa photographs t take us in another direction and that is one of hope. Photographers Norman Gershwin and Stuart Huck set out upon an artistic journey which forces us to reconsider our understanding of Muslims in the final estimation and humanity as a whole. Stuart Huck was born and raised in Chicago. He took his first photography class at the Center of the Eye in Aspen. Formal photography studies continued at Columbia College in Chicago and then the University of New Mexico where he earned his degree with a special emphasis on the history of photography and alternative photographic processes. Returning to Aspen, he began a long association with the Hill Gallery of Photography, where his large format color landscape photographs were a mainstay. Stewart began teaching at the Colorado Mountain College in Aspen in the early 80s. In addition to camera and darkroom classes, he has led numerous photography workshops in the mountains around Aspen and also the desert canyons of southern Utah. For the CMC Professional Photography Program, he taught courses in the history of photography and visual perception. In the 90s, he opened a custom photography lab and studio uh, in, in Basalt and just down the valley from Aspen. One of his customers there was Norman Gershman, an active photographer and retired Wall Street headhunter. Their mutual interest and similar philosophy about photography led to a strong friendship. Just as the digital revolution in photography was taking its toll on traditional photography labs, Norman asked Stewart for his assistance and expertise on a new project which he was undertaking, photographing the righteous Muslims in Albania. Sensing an opportunity of historic pr proportion, he jumped at the chance. In planning the trip, they decided how they would work as a team, with Stu handling the technical side, making sure that the camera settings and light were perfect, and Norm concent concentrating on making compelling portraits. As a team, they function extremely well together and continued sharing the task of this project today. In addition to the field work, Stu has made, 25, has made a 25 minute video about the program using photographs they made in Albania with a voiceover by Norm. As he designed the cover of the book, Bessa, Muslims Who Saved Jews in the World as well. And that book is for sale at the, uh, at the door. When not for photographing uh, up on the mountains or down the down in the desert, Stu can be found on his bike and on the air. Jazz on Thursday night, a show he has hosted on Aspen Public Radio for some 20 years, can still be heard live uh, or on podcast. And of course, many hours are spent in his digital darkroom making the images and scenes, images and, and scenes seen in, in his camera come alive as prints. It is now my honor to welcome Stu Huck to the stage for tonight's program. Thank you. Thank you, Shia. It's really an honor to be here. Um, thank you for inviting me here to talk about this project. This project has really been the highlight of my life. It's an extraordinary thing, um, and I thank Norm for inviting me to become a part of it and to continue to be a part of it. Uh, he's sorry that he can't be here tonight. He's just not traveling well at the moment. He's got having some back problems. So um, I hope you're not too disappointed to be stuck with me. Um, when I started on this project in 2002, Norm said, "You know, I'm, I think I'm, we're going to go to I'm going to go to Albania. Would you like to come along and help me on this project?" And I said, "Well, tell me what it's all about." And he said, "Well, it's about photographing righteous persons, and a righteous person is." Uh, someone who has been designated as righteous by Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Museum in uh, Jerusalem, uh, for as a non-Jew who saved the life of a Jew during the Holocaust. And I said, yeah, that's, 
that sounds interesting, I'd like to go along with that. And he said, the interesting thing is we're going to go to Albania, and it's a, Albania is a predominantly Muslim country. And I said, I'm in. This, this is something I want to do. Obviously, the events of 9-11, 2001, were still very strongly in our minds at this point. And um, I think we wanted to do something. We wanted to do, to do something important about that. And I, we thought that this could possibly be it. So I jumped at the chance of doing it after our first trip to Albania, the first of six or seven trips to Albania to make these photographs. Um, we knew that we were on to something. And uh, many, many people have chimed in on this. There is a uh, film about this project, a movie, a 90-minute movie that has just been completed. I watched it with Norm on Friday night for the first time. And we're going to see a trailer of that, 12-minute trailer of that movie uh, in just a minute. And uh, we have the book out. The exhibition that you have here is one of three exhibitions that is touring this country under the aegis of Hebrew Union College in New York. There is another exhibition traveling internationally uh, sponsored by Yad Vashem uh, in Jerusalem, where we had an opening at Yad Vashem in uh, the first time that Yad Vashem or really any Israeli uh, museum had honored Muslims. And uh, it was, I got to be there, and it was really, really incredible. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the Israeli press covered it, and Al Jazeera was there covering it as well. And it was, and there were reunions of uh, Albanians that we brought over from Albania with the families of the people that they had saved. That was really, really moving um, and spectacular. Um, so just to get a good overview of this, I think we'll just show the movie now, and then I'll talk a little bit more about the pictures after that. So if you want to just start the film. Every time I go to Albania, I always seek out a church to say a prayer. Here is a Jew in a Christian chapel praying in Arabic. It's a prayer of hope. We call it different names, but there is only one God. It's completing the circle the circle of Christians and Jews and Muslims. Because that's the purpose of this whole project, is about good people, whether they're Muslims or whether they're Jews. And that's what I photograph, good people. There were moments of great danger. We were Jews, we are Jews. We were protected by them. Ukrainian saved Jews, Poles saved Jews, French saved Jews, and, you know, many people saved Jews. Muslims? What are you, crazy? Spia a spia zotit, spia nikot, the spia yon. Padre Niño tenía una sobrinita resueña linda como muñeca y se perdió y cuando me acuerdo me duele, me, me vienen las lágrimas. Un millón trescientos mil niños inocentes como angelitos se fueron todos a la ceniza.
היינו מהבודדים שבאנו ארבעתנו ביחד, שלא חסר מאיתנו. כי אנחנו יצאנו ארבעה וחזרנו ארבעה. classic out there. This is it. This is what I remember. <laughs> the project started approximately five years ago. There's an organization called the Jewish Foundation for the Righteous. And I contacted them with the idea I would like to do portraits of these people now that are still alive. Righteous people. Hello, I'm Norman Gerson, the very first night. In the course of the conversation, they told me about Albania being a Muslim country. I said, oh, that's what I want to do. That's the story. So it evolved that way. I didn't have a storyline. I didn't have a, you know, a script. I didn't have a, you know, other than I knew I was on to something. There were 10 times as many Jews in Albania after the war than before the war. Refugees fleeing Hitler. And I remember hordes of people standing in front of the synagogue and throwing stones into the windows. It was a horrible shriek, and my own shouted, it is the Germans we will not see you anymore. And he started to talk about my father, my father, and our father. You are Jews. You need here a place where you are. From behind, there was a place where you are all in the dark. And everyone was afraid. We were 11 people that saved ourselves from the Holocaust, really, because we got permission to come to Albania. dhe kush shpëton, kush bën përpjekje për të shpëtuar jetën e një njeriu, ka shpërblimin të ki madhi sot, si kur ka shpëtuar gjithë njerëzimin. Dhe kështu muslimoni ka për detyr të ndimëj të tjerët. Ndimëj të tjerët në vështirësi. Në vështirësi. Në vështirësi. Në ajëve fiku, më thiri, në Tiran, dhe më tha, a ke mundësi që ti marrish këta e brejt, me i quen kryj, për ashtu se e Gjerman ke i kërkoj. Dhe për t'i kapi, a i do t'i përshkatoj. Që shi ganë shumë për atë punë, dhe gjithë isha shumë i vogël. Zahurli, këmoshe zë haja hajom, ima sheli blondinit i menajmë kullot, ושמו לה רעלה, כמו שהמוסלמים היו הולכים שם. ושתרסי נמא דה כמי פסקור כמי קלו, פוסט בלוג עם גרמן. כיש איזה אני טרא, זה מה זה מנקוב ססנגרי אשר טראו, אתו נוק כיש איזה קלקלוי. אני זוכרת את זה, שאיזשהו שומר או גרמני, אני לא יודעת מי זה היה, הייתה נראית לו חשודה. עיניים כחולות, מוסלמית, בלונדינית, וכולנו. הוא אמר לה שהיא תוריד את הרעלה. אז היא ברגע כך עשתה איזה פנים, מה? כאילו, איך אני אגלה את הפנים שלי לגבר זר? עשתה איזה תנועה ככה דבילית. ומה טוב 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 אתה ברוך. פרצו דינטון, אונגרית טראו, קורקלו מפס בלוגון גרמן, אתר תאמנה לם, לינדם פשדותי. נוגי פרמנים דוט לוטות. הם לקחו סיכון כל כך גדול. She has a beautiful smile. Look at that smile. You know why she has a good smile? Because she and her family did good deeds. Tell me more about those times. What happened when the Nazis came in? What was it like? 
It was a terrible time. They didn't know they were going to live or die. If there was a knock on the door and they were taken in, who knows? They had no idea what would happen to them. The Nipi Argus, Ervitine, Ervitha, Medjith, Dislocimine Forza Germania, Unca Martin Reserve, Meubani Proposim. Ervitha, she came in family Israelite, she got art in Pristina. Got a catervisor. Edita Rachela, you took it early technique. Ani Josebet, Chaiti, it's a mishpachat hotishana, horebechat kaits. Kaken spia halestor, ku Rachela, you took it mete. Por, kur delte ajo, delte me zakonisht me postanin e motër steme, me byrde ose diçka këtu. A të mblojti me se pahat, të mit hashanu ki pa me cëfë katut, ki a me i jehudia. Baba e arsitur në këtë mërë, ata janë, janë halë, kanë nevoj. Pra me në skemi si ju në ndirë. I mit pusu ati, kola hacer shel hoti o lech le zazeg. Ishe loja davar katan, ishe aja giborut katolali. If the Germans had found out, they would have not only killed those people, but their whole families. Everybody knew that we were Jews. And nobody ever made an issue of it or denounced us. And here was a group of Muslims who were so devoted that they put their lives on the line to save Jews. And, and that's, I think, really the essence here. I'm going back to Albania after 62 years. It is going to be very exciting to see Idib Pilkul. After all, he's really the only person that shared these experiences with me. I am a very famous motor and a very famous motor. I am not sure if I am going to be able to do this. I am going to be able to do this. Welcome. Welcome. This is my, my Frau. E dy të mësërri më rrimë meni është fiksu meni që si do të vija jo, si do të zbrezi nga aeroplani, si do të mi prese. Ku që disë se si a do të qajmë, a do të qajmë, a do të... Një knesi që po vjene e po nuk di se si të presë. Një gjejnë në njënë se si të presë. After the war, the country was torn apart by this vicious, paranoid, crazy, 50 years of communism. For the Koch, too, is the installer system of communist, which is not a shikon to me, so to me, the Maradonian, me, Nierzit, Yash, Cyprus. The mayor of Kabaye, this is according to my father, gave to every head of the family a document which stated that we are Muslims. Emra ishin marrë në ishin pseudonime që ato të mos gjyshoshin se ishin ebrej. Davidi kishte pasaport me emrin Daud. Esteri kishte emrin Fatime. Ahar të gvinave basar, 
אחר כך עשיתי מה שהמוסלמים עושים. אלבניה זה אונלי קאנטרי, ואת דנמרק. The only two countries where the government actively helped the individuals to save Jews. It was a big love. My father loved him like a son. He said, I don't know. 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 ‫הוא מדוקו שקור, יוזף גרדלין, ‫הם קומטו גדרה. ‫הלאה היא קם כתוב קוק. ‫בתקופה שהייתי ילד קטן, ‫אני פשוט לא ידעתי להעריך את ה... ‫והיום אני מודה להם. ‫-תודה רבה, ‫על כל הישראלים שלכם, ‫על כל הישראלים שלכם. ‫אני מתכוון בהרבה מיוחדים ‫לחזור לבית, ‫כי יש עוד סיפור. ‫תודה רבה. ‫זה צריך להיות מובן. defy anybody to say these people are terrorists or terrorist sympathizers. There are good people in the world. They're righteous people. There's anonymous rescuers. They risked everything. They're forgotten. If I can get the remnant of a story, it has to live as a testament to the goodness of people. Okay, we're hoping that that film will uh, premiere at um, Sundance in January. And uh, at that point, we'll hope that they will find a uh, distributor, and next year this film will be distributed and be out. 70 minutes film that is very, very powerful. And I'm thrilled to be a part of it, and I'm thrilled to be a part of this project. Uh, this is the book, and they do have it out front. And I'm very proud that I did design the book cover. <laughs> and uh, I've done a lot of things on this project that I never did before. I never did graphic arts before, but now I'm doing graphic arts, book design, making films, and all kinds of things. Could I have the next slide, please? Please? <laughs> there we go. Uh, the first thing that I had to do when Norm asked me to uh, come along with him to Albania was to look up in the atlas where Albania is. I did not know at the time. Most people that I talk to about this project don't know, so I want to include a map here so you can see where Albania is. Just north of Greece, just below Montenegro, and right across the Adriatic and Ionian uh, from Italy. Um, a word about the Albanians. Um, when they see this book and this project about Muslims who saved Jews in World War II, universally Albanians say, no, that's wrong. You don't have it right. It wasn't Muslims who saved Jews. It was Albanians who saved Jews. There's a very famous saying in Albania. The religion of Albania is Albanianism. That being said, Albania is 70% Muslim, 10% Orthodox. No, 10% Catholic and 20% Orthodox. Um, we did not know as we were going around Albania um, whether the people that we were going to meet at any given place that we went were going to be Orthodox, Muslim, or Catholic. Um, but we did know that they had saved Jews and that we wanted to tell their story, we wanted to photograph them and tell their story. Can I have the next slide, please? This is one of the first families that we met, the Kazazi family, you can see. One sister is in Western dress, one sister in traditional Muslim dress, and uh, the male of the family in a nice suit. Um, not a whole lot of veils in Albania, but it's okay if you want to wear a veil. It's okay if you don't want to wear a veil. There's no thing on it. The Albanians are very, very proud of their religious tolerance. Um, 
it's very, very important to them. Um, and that's why they say, you got it wrong. It's not about Muslims. It's about Albanians. But it, I, <laughs> it's when I had a fun conversation with the lady who wears the veil, because the, the young women in Albania are very stylish and wear them out of the day and show a fair amount of skin. And I said, well, what do you think about the, the styles of the day that the young girls are wearing? Um, only because she's about the age of my mother, and my mother and I often got into discussions about this, and my mother was, oh, they shouldn't wear that and all that. And her response was, I don't judge them about how they dress. I hope they will not judge me about how I dress. Nice. Next slide, please. This is the Baba of the Bektashi Muslims, which are centered in Albania. And it was really fascinating to meet someone of like this. I had never met anyone, a holy man, who was totally responsible for an entire religion as he was. And I could feel that responsibility that he had, that he was responsible for the entire religion of Bektashi. But he also had the responsibility for the for every Bektashi, every Bektashi's faith, that the faith was there and would be real to them. And that's a lot of responsibility. Um, and I still remember what he said, and it's on the, the, the paper that's next to his picture out there. So that we Bektashi believe that God is in every poor and in every cell. All are God's children. There can be no infidels. If you see a good face, you are seeing the face of God. Could I have the next slide, please? And I often think of that when I see this picture. And I think about what it must have been like to have been a Jew, having to leave your home where your family had lived for generations and to be hunted like dogs for no reason other than that you were a Jew, you know, because you had blue, blue eyes, because you're short, because you're tall, what, or you're left-handed, whatever. That was the, the thing at the time. And you go to a strange country, a strange land, where they speak a strange language, and believe me, Albania is a very different language. And you knock on a door, because you heard that these m people might help you. And you say, help me, can you help me, I'm Jewish. And this is the face you see when you come to that door and that door is opened. In many cases, Jews were literally walking the streets, knocking on doors at random. In every case, that door was opened, they were invited in, and they were treated as honored guests. One guy told us the story, his mother was widowed, and all she had was their home, their house, and so she made it into a boarding house. When the Jews came and she took them in, she didn't take them in as boarders. She took them in as guests. So she was losing income from the room that they had. And she refused. You know, they, they offered to pay. And she said, no, I, you are my guest. You can't do that. And he remembers that his mother would give him cigarettes and matches to go out and sell on the streets to the German soldiers to get money to buy food for the guests in the house. Can I have the next slide, please? Whenever you go into a home in Albania, it, there is a hospitality ritual. You're always met with raki, which is the national drink of Albania. And it's a very potent <laughs> drink of Albania. There's always food. And there is just, you are welcomed into the home as an honored guest. And you are then under their besa. And it took me a while to figure out what this BESA thing was all about. And it's still a fairly difficult thing to understand. But I will tell you that when you are under an Albanian's BESA, they will literally lay down their lives for you. Literally. They have this tradition of blood feud, feuds in, Al in Albania. And it, <laughs> you know they want to kill this other guy. But if he's in your house and he's under your BESA, they have to kill you first before they can get to the other guy to kill them. They take that very, very seriously. And I really felt that in every home that I went into, how I was totally welcomed there. Okay, the next slide, please. And it was 
with one ex two exceptions. When we went to see the Baba, of course, that was in a mosque, so we were not, not sort of uh, racky. But there was only one other house, which I'll show you the slide of, that we were not offered racky. Every time we would be, this is Petrit Kika, and uh, wonderful man. Next slide, please. People often ask me about, about this slide, about this picture, because here she is, she's wearing the veil, holding the Koran and a glass of raki. Um, it is proper because, again, it is the national drink of Albania is raki. She did not drink any raki. Um, after, actually, we had to walk about two miles to get up to her house. The car would not make it in the on the road that we were on. And um, we were surprised that she was there and she didn't move from this chair during, during the entire time that we were there. Although she did tell the story pretty well. Her, her, her sons and daughters did fill in different parts of it. Um, one of the things that she pointed out to us is when the, uh, the Jewish family was there, it was during Ramadan. And she still went out and gathered firewood and gathered food for, the, for her guests, even though it was Ramadan. She wanted to do that for them, because that was, that was as important as Ramadan, was taking care of her guests. When we went to make the photograph of her, she just was kind of just sitting there in the chair and was not very animated doing anything. So we brought in the Koran, and she just laid in her arms. She didn't do anything. And so we said, well, how about a glass of Raki? And she thought that was just the silliest thing she'd ever heard. And she really perked up. And so it really made for a wonderful picture. Next slide, please. These are these two guys. Uh, this was the only place where we weren't offered Raki is when we went in to this house. And this was, again, very early in our, in our travels through Albania. But I was starting to get the notion and see that I was not seeing um, heirlooms in any of the homes that we visited. But we went into this, these two guys' apartment, and this is just right outside the door here. And one of the things I remember was that the ceiling had a sag in it about like that, which mirrored the sag in the sofa that went like that as well. Um, all they had to share, they didn't have any racky, they, we had, uh, between six of us, two cans of Albanian cola. But in one corner was this beautiful, nice, antique radio. In another corner was this sewing machine. And another corner was this beautiful chest. And it was nice wood, it was nice stuff. And it didn't belong there. I'm going, you know, heirloom, there's, there's something else going on here. And as they told us the story, the Jews that they, that they sheltered had brought that with them. And they asked them to save it because they wanted to come back for it, if they could do that. And I, it really struck me because here was the first hard evidence. You know, this stuff was out of place. You know, something else happened here. And so th they were able to keep all this stuff during the years of communism. Because during communism, if you had you know, some nice stuff. You didn't have any property. You didn't own anything. And it was taken. But because they didn't own it, you know, they were just holding it for somebody else. They were able to keep it and hang on to it. Also, the seashells there, uh, one of the uh, people that they sheltered was a sea captain and gave them some seashells as well, which they held on to. Next slide, please. Marusha. What a beautiful smile she has. And she's just a beautiful woman. I also saw a picture of her as a young woman. And it, there was no mistaking that it was the same person because of that smile. Uh, the letters that she's holding are the letters from Israel, from the uh, now grown woman who was the same age as her when she was uh, being sheltered in their house in, in Albania. And when we had the opening at Yad Vashem in Jerusalem, they did a wonderful job creating that show. The photographs were like four by five feet. And in front of this huge four by five foot print of this, you know, here's this little woman. I mean, I'm practically a you know, full head taller than her standing in front of this, getting her pictures taken. And I said, you must be Marusha's friend. And I just, she was just, she is that wonderful as her smile. And I just look at her and I always think such warm things. And she was such a beautiful woman and so warm. And uh, 
it was just a delight to meet her and be a part of what she had done. Next slide, please. This is Professor Katani, Professor Apostol Katani. Um, Norm began to tell the story there in the film a little bit about um, how Jewish Foundation for the Righteous and all that. The way it actually happened is that he got a fundraising letter from the Jewish Foundation for the Righteous. And in that letter were some photographs of righteous people. And the photographs were so bad they offended him. And he called them and said, I'm not going to give you any money, but I'm happy to offer you my services as a photographer, and I'd very much like to photograph righteous people. And they said, no, thanks, we'd prefer the money. And they said, well, where did you get these photographs? I mean, what's that? And he said, well, we get our photographs from Yad Vashem. Why don't you call them? So we called Yad Vashem. And Yad Vashem said, well, no, we're not really interested in that. But he was very persistent. And finally, they put him in touch with the guy who ran the Righteous Persons program. And uh, he was kind of reluctant, said, well, if you want to come over, you, you can. You know, he said, we've, one thing, we don't have any pictures from Albania, and we've got just a few people from Albania that we've certified as righteous. And if you want to come through, come here and look at our records, you can do that. So he went to Jerusalem, went to Yad Vashem, and looked at the records on Albania. And they were all in Hebrew or Albanian, neither of which Norm spoke. But uh, they put him in touch with uh, a group called the Israeli-Albanian Friendship Association that was started by some Jews who were rescued in Albania. And they then put him in touch with their sister organization, the Albanian-Israeli Friendship Association. Now, Yad Vashem has so far certified about 30 Albanian families as righteous. And at this time, we figured that there were about 30 righteous families in Albania, and that would be our trip, and we'd go and do that, and that would be the end of things. A week before we left for Albania, we got an itinerary and a list from Professor Zorba of the Albanian-Israeli Friendship Association of a list of over 150 Albanian families that they knew of, and an itinerary to go and meet 40 or 50 of them during the two and a half weeks that we had scheduled to be in Albania. This was getting pretty comical because Norm's uh, personal assistant at that time told me, now make sure Norm gets his afternoon nap because, boy, he'll be a mess without it. We worked every day from uh, about 8 in the morning till 9 or 10 at night every day without a break while we were there. The Professor Katani is one of the, along with Professor Zorba, the two important people at the Albanian-Israeli Friendship Association. And Professor Katani has a little notebook in which he has this written the stories, the names and the stories of all the people that he could find who saved Jews during World War II. He just took it upon himself after he retired. He was in the communist regime and in that administration. But after he retired, he took it upon himself to write the history of the Jews in Albania. And a big part of that was finding all the people who had rescued Jews during World War II. Without Professor Katani, there was no project. There was nothing. And because of Professor Katani, the story is out there and living. Next slide, please. Professor is an honorific. He does not teach at a college or anything. It's just because he has published a number of books. And you can see this one is partially in English, the Hebrews in Albania during the centuries. Um, it's not good English. Uh, we're trying to figure out a way to get this work translated into English so that these stories, and to honor Professor Katani, because without him, none of, the, none of this would have come to light. Next slide, please. These are some photographs I took. This is how we worked together. First thing we would do is we'd go to a home and we'd meet the people. We'd go through the, the whole hospitality ceremony, we drink our raki and have nuts and fruits, and then we'd ask them to tell us their story. Tell us of the Jews, that you, who were they, how did you meet them, why did you do it, um, tell, us, tell us everything you can. And that's Norm there on the left with the red socks. Next to him in the purple shirt is our translator, Albina, and there's Professor Katani in the middle and the two Albanians who we were interviewing there. Next slide, please. After we would spend a good hour, two hours with them, talking about them, I also want you to note that he had typed up his, the, he, had, he had it all typed up, the story about this. And 
he didn't have to refer to the notes very often. <laughs> he, he really knew the story. Next slide, please. And then we decided to say, now we'd like to photograph you. Um, so th I would, as things were, would be winding up, and I could tell things were winding up, I would start looking for places to photograph where I knew the light would be good. Um, and, that, and then I'd get with Norm and say, OK, this is what I think. So then we'd, we'd, we'd almost always agree on all that. The reason I chose to put them there is you can see that they're in the shade, a little bit of sunlight on one of the guy's heads there, but they're in the shade so that the light is even on them, although it's midday, about the most difficult time to photograph. But this is also in this town of Barat, and you can see the walls are white, whitewashed, and Barat is a UN historical designated city. It's a beautiful city, and it's all whitewashed and, and really beautiful. It's a very medieval kind of town. And um, they did a lot of wonderful things in, in Barat. Not only did they save Jews there, there is an, a fabulous book called Albanian Rescue by a woman who was an Army, U.S. Army nurse. And they had been on an internal flight in Italy after the Italian capitulation. And a storm came up. They got lost. And they ended up in Al crash landing in Albania. I mean, that's a long. They worked hard to get into Albania, and then not just right on the coast, way inland they got. And it tells of, uh, Barat plays uh, a big part in that. Um, it's a wonderful town and wonderful people in it. And the next slide, please, will be the photograph that appears in the book of these two guys. And so that's, that's kind of how we worked. And the next slide, please. This is Refik Hoja. He appeared in the movie, and he ended up really being the star of the movie. Again, this is early on our first trip when we met uh, Mr. Hoja. And um, after we interviewed him, and just before we started to photograph, he said, I want to show you something. And he went up to uh, a bookshelf, and he pulled down these three books that were written in Hebrew. And he said, the family that we sheltered left these books here. And they said they were going to come back and get them, and they never good, did. And my father told me that it was my duty to return these books to their rightful owner. So I really want you to, to help me find these people so that we can return the books to them. Well, that was a big deal. And you know, they were inscribed, so we at least knew the name. But that's all we had to go on was a name. Uh, we knew that they came from Bulgaria and um, tried some research in Bulgaria and got nowhere. Um, an inter very interesting thing happened. A friend of Norm's who we had told this story to, she was very interested in the book and he told all the stories in the book and she was just fascinated that this Albanian family had these three Hebrew books, books written in Hebrew. And so we told her the story and the name of the guy. And, you know, and a month later, she was in New York at her sister's house. And there was a friend of a friend who was an Israeli soldier who was visiting and they over there for dinner. And Randy told the guy this story and gave the name. A week later, he called and said, we found him. How they found him, we still don't know, except that it was really meant to be that, that they found him. Um, he had changed his name. They found, uh, they, the film co uh, crew called him. And as soon as he, they said Albania, he hung up. They were able to contact his son and tell him the story. Say, and his son said, my father was an Albanian? I had no idea. He hadn't told his son that he had been in Albania. The film crew arranged a meeting with Rafiq Hoja and the guy with the books and didn't tell him that Rafiq had the books. And the flew Rafiq to Israel to meet him and has on film the uh, pulling the books out, giving them back to him. It's really an amazing, amazing thing. He's a wonderful, wonderful man. Next slide, please. This gentleman, also from Barat, who had also written down his memories of 
saving the Jews, is an imam. His father was an imam. His grandfather was an imam. Oh, let me tell you one more very interesting thing about Mr. Hoja before I go on. Hoja is Albanian for imam. And it's kind of uh, ironic that the uh, communist dictator of Albania was Enver Hoxha, because he outlawed religion. But Rafik had two uncles who were imams. One was Sunni, one was Shia. Interesting. So his father was an imam, and the way he told the story is when the Jews came and knocked on their door and asked for shelter, the reaction that his father told his children that he had at that time was this is an opportunity for me to exercise my Islamic faith. Could I have the next slide, please? This is also one of the Kazazi sisters from that first, first slide where one is wearing the veil and the other one is not. This is the third sister. She lives in Italy. And uh, she came back from Italy just to meet us because uh, she remembered Mimo who was also in the movie, and, um, but she wanted to be a part of it. And it was wonderful because she'd gone to Italy as a young woman and had a career in opera in Italy. So after she told us the story and we were going to go photograph her and we're trying, you know, and I said, so why don't you sing a little bit for us? She goes, oh, no, 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 my voice is gone. I couldn't possibly. I haven't had a voice for years and years and years. And we just said, oh, come on, sing a little Carmen. Sing a little Carmen for us. Oh, no, I couldn't. Of course you can't. Please do. Finally, she started singing Carmen. And I mean, she just transformed. You could tell that she was a real pro and just got into it. And this is just out on the street in Tirana. And I mean, in no, a couple of Americans with camera equipment, we always you know, drew something of a crowd. But it was her performance that we had about 50, 60 people around us by the time we finished with this. She's just a wonderful lady. Next slide, please. Shaban Kuchi. Um, I've just found out that he has recently passed away. And I'm so sorry to hear it, because he was such a wonderful guy. He was funny. And I mean, we're working through an interpreter here. And Shaban would say something, and the interpreter would break out laughing. And he'd tell it to us, and you know, without any of the correct inflections or anything like that, we were always just cracking up. The guy was really funny. He's wearing his medals from serving as a uh, partisan during World War II. Uh, the partisans then became the Communist Party, and he was a communist, a very firm communist, remains one, remained one all his life, and uh, a firm Muslim as well. He was, didn't see any problem being a communist and a Muslim. That worked out fine for him. But he was, you know, you heard uh, in the movie these things about how they're hiding everybody and, you know, being very hush-hush about it and not letting anybody know and dressing people up in, in traditional, old-fashioned uh, Albanian dress. Could I have the next slide, please? That's Shaban Kuchi with the Jewish woman that he had a huge crush on that he was sh sheltering, walking in downtown Tirana during the German occupation. He said, you did that. He gave us the negatives. He couldn't find a print of it, so he gave us the negative and did that. And I said, how could, you know, how dangerous was that? You don't want you to say, ah, dangerous, it wasn't dangerous. I go, yeah, you were walking with a Jew. Jew, what's a Jew look like? They weren't going to do anything. I wouldn't let them tar her. He's hilarious doing that. So they're there during the German occupation, walking down downtown Tirana. Next slide, please. So here we have Shaban Kuchi and Professor Katani singing the international for us. <laughs> Next slide. Um, again, I pointed out that not everybody who saved Jews in Albania uh, was a Muslim. This particular family was Orthodox. But the story, what they did was so amazing. I wanted to include that. It's not in the book or anything like that, but it was a fabulous story. This guy had just died about a month or two before, and his, his wife was still very much in uh, mourning. She was crying through the whole, the whole thing. And uh, that's his daughter. And she spoke excellent English, by the way, so we didn't need a translator for that one. But is what happened was um, during the war, first Italy invaded Albania in 1939. Um, Albanians will tell you that was the opening of World War II, not the invasion of Poland by Germany. Um, so, but when Italy capitulated, 
right? Then the Germans moved up from Greece and over from Yugoslavia to take over Albania. Um, there were so many Jews in Eastern Europe that uh, the Nazis had trouble processing all of them in Yugoslavia. And so they just sent a couple hundred Jews over to Albania for the Italians to watch over and put into detention camps until the Germans could get around to processing them. So there were a couple of these, of these camps in Albania. Um, they were by no means concentration camps. People worked during the day. They had businesses in the camps. Uh, they came and go, went as they pleased. Not as they pleased, but they could come and go. But when uh, Italy capitulated, uh, the Italian commander of the camp in Cavaia just opened the doors of the camp and said, save yourselves, the Germans are coming. Now, all very well and good, but they had no papers, no passports, no identification, no nothing, so that they couldn't get out of Albania. They were stuck there and the Germans were coming. What were they going to do? Well, this guy happened to have befriended a couple of the Jews in the, in the camp. And so he, you know, well, I can do something. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help here. So he got on his bicycle and uh, went and broke into the local prefect and uh, broke in and took like 250 passports blank back to the camp. There was a uh, photo studio and lab there, so everybody got photographed. And, and then they said, realized he didn't have the stamp to verify it. He went back, <laughs> broke into the prefect, got the stamp, brought it back, and some 250 people were saved that way and were able to get out of, El get out of Albania and flee from the Germans before they got there. Pretty amazing story. Next, next slide, please. This is the current king of Albania. He's uh, king in name only. Um, they did have a, an election back in, after the fall of communism to see if they wanted to reinstate the monarchy and that failed by a large margin. Um, when I run into somebody who I haven't seen for a while, my friends in Aspen, and they say, gee, I haven't seen you, what have you been up to? I always say, well, I've been going to Albania. And that always gets a, usually gets a good giggle. But I said, this one I saw Ruth, who I hadn't seen for a while. There's a reason she just divorced a friend of mine. So I was finally <laughs> willing to let bygones be by bygones. And I did the old, yeah, well, I've been going to Albania. And she said, I have to talk to you about that. I said, talk to me, tell me. And she said, well, my mother's family was rescued during the war by King Zog, the king of Albania. Wait, wait, what? <laughs> You're telling me that King Zog saved Jews? Okay, so there was only one king of Albania, and that was King Zog. He came to, came to power. He went up through being in parliament and then becoming the prime minister and then finally declared himself king and ruled through the late 20s until the, the day, literal day of the uh, Italian occupation, which was also the day that Lecca was born. Uh, they fled Albania two days after he was born uh, over the horrid roads of Albania into Greece and um, survived that. So, you know, this was new information. This was entirely new information. And that is because Professor Catani being a strong communist and strong partisan. Um, the partisans fought the royalists after the Germans left to see who would come into power. So he was not a big fan of the royalists or the royal family. But what I found out was that Ruth's family had been, they lived in Vienna, Austria, and they were the premier photographers in Vienna and in, indeed were photographers to the royal court of Vienna at the time. And King Zog, when he wanted to go do king and royal stuff, would go to Vienna because there wasn't a whole lot of king stuff to do in Albania and got to know Ruth's family. Um, and indeed, her family even photographed Zog's wedding. So when Zog heard about Kristallnacht and the fact that the Jews were you know, really in dire straits, um, he invited Ruth's family to come to Albania and 17 members of her family, including one who had already been put in a concentration camp, somehow 
Zod was able to get him out of the concentration camp and back to Albania. Zod then said, you know, just told the embassy in Vienna, give Albanian passports to anyone who requests one. And over 400 passports were given out from Vienna, from King Zog. And this is his son, King Leka, who was kind enough to allow us to come in and photograph him. Also, um, we met another fellow there who was an attendant to the court of the king, and his photograph is here. He's standing in front of a pool table at, at the king's residence. And uh, as royalists, they had also saved a Jewish family. So all, the, all these different parties, the partisans, the royalists, there's another group called the Baalists, then you know, you've got the Catholics and the Orthodox and the Muslims. And the other thing that's really, really important is one of those first pictures that I showed you of the family holding the Rocky and the grapes and all that. That guy had been a shepherd, a shepherd, a very simple shepherd, and he saved a family of Jews. And the king of Albania saved Jews. Everybody, everybody in Albania did this. This is, to me it is still, a, as many books have been written about the Holocaust and how it happened and what happened, and there have been thousands of books written, I still cannot for the life of me understand how the culture of Germany that gave us Beethoven and Bach and Goethe descended into Nazism. But the other side of that is this culture in Albania that somehow evolved in such a way that everyone was a rescuer, the entire culture, the entire country, no matter what their station in life, no matter how they identified themselves politically or religiously, everyone rescued Jews. It's what they did. It's who they are as Albanians. It's what the Albanian culture is. And why that happened is as big a mystery as what happened in Germany. But it's very, very worthy of study, and I hope that it will be studied and people will look at it. Can I have the next slide, please? This is just a really wonderful picture, and I just really love it. These three guys across the top are brothers, and it's the one on the right, those are his two daughters. Um, he knew that his parents, his father, rescued a Jewish family in Barat. He didn't know their names because it wasn't, it wasn't a big deal, and his father didn't make a big deal of it. So he didn't really have much to tell us, you know, and he was kind of confused that we came all the way from America to ask him about this. And he was really sorry that he didn't have a good story to tell, really, but, you know, um, because it wasn't that big a deal. Next slide, please. Mustafa Resniki, he also passed recently. Um, he put together the Kosovo Israeli Friendship Association. And Mustafa was the first Kosovar to be recognized by Yad Vashem as righteous among the nations, largely due to work that we did to see to it that that happened. Uh, the, holding the flag of Albania, at the time we took this picture, we didn't realize how political that was. This was, uh, again, an early trip, 2003, 2004. And of course, Kosovo is now its own nation. Um, Mustafa, it's, and it's, it says the story is on there, had come down with typhus, and that was a fatal disease. No question about it, in Kosovo in the 1940s, when Dr. Abrabamel, who had been, came from Shkopi, came to the town, his parents sheltered him, and Dr. Abrabamel saved his life. We contacted the family of Dr. Abrabamel in Israel, and when we had the opening in, at Yad Vashem, we brought Mustafa to Israel to meet the family of Dr. Abrabamel. And here was Mustafa, who was only alive because of what Dr. Abrabamel did for him, and Dr. Abrabamel's family, who were only there because of what Mustafa's family did. It was one of the most emotional experiences of my life, being present at that reunion. And it's something that we'd like out of this project, is to have more reunions take place. Next slide, please. 
This is Mustafa in front of the house, his parents' house. When this happened, this was destroyed in the 1999 war. Next slide, please. And uh, I just love this photograph, too. It's an intense face from, and uh, how he moved uh, a number of Jewish families to this small mountain town in Zalhar. Next slide, please. Wonderful characters in Albania. Again, this, they, they rescued Jews, but what incredible characters, what great faces. Next slide, please. This is also in Kosovo. This, this picture is, is out there. Um, this is very interesting. You may have noticed that we're not, uh, we, we photographed all these with natural light and available light. In this case, this was at night, and the only available light um, was a 60-watt bulb in the middle of the room, so we brought the chair underneath it. I am right up below the, the frame level holding a reflector back up so that we can reflect some light back in. Um, and it's a, it's a wonderful story, and it's, it's on there how the Jew that he'd saved he thought was pretty weird because this guy never took his clothes off even to go to bed or anything. And it turned out that he'd sewed all kinds of gold coins in his clothes and was afraid to take them off or they'd be stolen. And they explained, no, no, we're Albanians. You know, you are our guest. You know, if, if, if that would be to break our besa if we were to steal from you. That couldn't possibly happen. Absolutely impossible. So they dressed the guy up as a in women's clothes, actually, in Albanians' women's clothes, and smuggled them off up into the mountains. Next slide, please. This is also in Kosovo. Kosovo is interesting now because it was occupied, it was part of Yugoslavia. And so it was occupied by the Germans during the entire war. And we found lots and lots of Albanian Muslims in Kosovo who rescued Jews who had not been recognized yet. This guy was from a fairly wealthy family. They were merchants. And uh, the Germans put him in jail, and, uh, got, took their house, took as many of their possessions as possible, left them uh, pretty well destitute. They were able to make back a pretty good amount of money before the communists took over. Communists threw him in jail. And that pretty much came close to breaking him. And in the next cell was a rabbi who had these prayer beads, they had little flowers in them. He said, it was these prayer beads that kept me going the whole time when I was in prison. And I thank that rabbi for giving me these prayer beads. And I think it's because our family saved a Jew during the war. And he doesn't let them out of his hand at all. Next slide, please. His two brothers were featured in the movie. Uh, one of them sadly has passed recently. The Vaselli brothers. And... Um, they're, they're the ones who quoted to me that, that I've since learned is a very famous quote in Albania, that the religion of Albania is Albanianism. But they're the, also the ones who said, our house is first God's house, second the house of our guest, and third our house. Next slide, please. Alita Bichako, she was, she, she was a kick. Albania is still a very male-dominated society, but she was, by golly, going to tell us the story about her father um, was pictured there. And they had moved uh, a group of like 25 Jews up to a, a town up in the mountains. And um, the, the people in the town said, look, the Germans are coming. They're going to find out there's Jews here. You got to get these guys out of here. So her father took them to a barn outside of town. And he told the people in the town, he said, if anybody gives us away, if anyone tells the Germans that we're here, I will kill you. And he stood, he stood watch out in front of the barn every night with a gun and said that, you know, they got to come through me if they're going to come for these folks. Next slide, please. Enver, Aliyah. In the movie, there, you may have noticed that there was one guy who was speaking Spanish. And that's this guy right here. And he's a dentist in Mexico. He went to Mexico after the war, and that's why the sombrero and the whole getup. These are pictures of his father, Enver's father. Um, he, was, he was saved, that dentist. And we brought the dentist, again, you saw the 
reunion at the, at the film. We brought the dentist from Mexico to Jerusalem and brought Enver from Albania for that reunion. It was fabulous. Next slide, please. These bunkers are all over Albania. Albania is about the size of Maryland in territory, in acreage. And Enver Hoxha, the communist dictator, put about 750,000 of these bunkers all over Albania because he, after he broke relations with both China and Russia because they weren't communist enough for him, realized that he was surrounded by enemies and had no friends to help him out. So that's what he did. And everybody, of course, was part of the, the arm, army. And so every Albanian had one of these bunkers that they were to uh, defend. And Verhoja told him that they were defending them from an imminent invasion from the United States. And they were all tremendously surprised when I told them, most people in the United States have no idea where Albania is. Next slide, please. This is Mr. Spuza. And when we went to interview Mr. Spuza, First of all, his parents had been cited as righteous, but you know, Norm said, do you have the citation? He goes, I, I don't know where that is. I can't find it. And we're talking to him and trying to get him to tell the story about his, about his parents, and he kept checking his watch and saying, you know, can, he finally said, can we get on with this? I, I really have to get back to work. And Norm said, you know, we really want to honor what your parents did. It was so special. It was so very special, and I want to thank you on behalf of the Jewish people, and it was so special. And he just said, my parents did nothing special. Any Albanian would do what my parents did. I believe that's the end of the presentation of the slides. So are there any questions that anybody has? Please? Yes. Would you go to the microphone right there so that everybody can hear? Um, It, that's that's a that's a funny story, actually. <laughs> yes, it is going to be. Um, when when we contacted the Holocaust Museum in Washington uh, several years ago, and uh, they they said that they were too busy and they really didn't have any room for us. Then Jason, who the producer of this movie, took it over there and showed it to them, and they just said, "Oh, we have to have an exhibition as soon as possible." with the opening of the movie. This is incredible. And it turned out that the guy who's the head of exhibitions at the Washington uh, Museum is, uh, is a nephew of Philip Glass. And he says, I'm going to take this to my, to my uncle and see if he wants to do the, do the music for us. So yes, they're, they're now on board. <laughs> Anyone else? Please. Yes. Okay, yeah, uh, that's fine. I, I'm a technical guy too, so I, I'll talk about that. We did shoot the whole thing on film, two and a quarter, used Mamaya six by seven equipment, shot it on Tri-X, um, and processed most of the film normally, but there was one or two that I did gave a little bit of plus minus to. But, uh, and then all the prints are digital prints. Then we then scanned the negatives and made digital prints from there. Okay, yes. Yes. Well, first of all, when the Germans came in, they went to the uh, they, they went to the government and said, "Give us, give us the name, the list of all the Jews that are in this country." And they said, "We don't know about it. There's, there's no Jews here. We don't know about any Jews." Now they knew that several hundred had been shipped into these detention camps. They knew that, but we know nothing about that. So that's one thing they did. And then also you heard the, um, the prime minister at the time, Kosheri, was a Bektashi. And the Bektashi said, the Jews will eat the food of your, your, the Jewish children will eat the food of your children. They will sleep with your children. They will be part of your family. That's what they said. But 
in truth, there was no underground railroad. My question to most everybody was, did your neighbors know that you were sheltering a Jewish family? More than half said, no, no, we didn't tell anyone. We didn't tell anyone we were sheltering people. So most of these people did this without anybody knowing that they were doing it. They never asked for any recognition. They never asked for any money. In many cases, the Jewish families they were sheltering were way better off than the Albanian families, but they would, would never ask for money. You don't ask that of a guest. So while the, the government did encourage it, you know, and th that might have been published, but at that time the literacy rate of Albania was about 30%. You know, there was one good thing that the communist dictator did, which wa was raise the literacy rate from 30% to virtually 100% and make sure everybody got a basic education. I'd be very hard pressed to find anything else good that that guy did. He really, really destroyed that, com that country. And I th part of what we're doing is we had a, a show in Albania at the uh, National Art Museum in, in Tirana of this work. And um, it was a very big deal in Albania. And I was very proud of it and proud to be a part of it, proud to be there because they just loved it. And it was kind of like we were bringing back the tradition of Besa to Albania that was possibly lost during the communist years. And to bring back what I think is the greatest, greatest thing in Albania is this sense of Besa. Yes. 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 Well, the name of the project is Muslims Who Save Jews. So to tell the truth, the pictures are of Muslims who save Jews. The exhibition in Albania was called Albanians Who Rescued Jews, and every picture that we took was included in that exhibition. Um, it's, it's interesting because so many of the Muslims that we interviewed felt that Besa was a part of their faith. The, the old shepherd who I'm pretty clear is still illiterate. He was born in 1915, so he didn't get to get a education, you know, couldn't read. He was certain that Besa was in the Koran. Well, Besa itself is not in the Koran, but certainly the spirit of Besa is in the Koran. If you save a life, it is as if you had saved the world, you had saved humanity, which interestingly enough, on the certificate of that, the, that Yad Vashem gives to people, uh, when they certify them as being righteous. That's what goes around the side of it. To, to save a life, to save one life, is to save the world. Um, yes, that's why I say that the Yad Vashem has that in righteous, on the, on the righteous thing, it's the same. You know, it's, what got me was the hook for me to say, yes, I want to sign on to this, that Muslims save Jews. That's really important information in the world. And then to go deeper and to find out about the entire culture of Albania and the culture of Besa and how this happened, that this entire culture, this entire country, everyone, from the king to a shepherd, no matter what, you know, 70% Muslim, overwhelmingly Muslim. But it wasn't just the Muslims, the Catholics, and the Orthodox as well. Um, there, there is a little bit of conflict there, I always have to say, because I honor the Albanians so much, and they, they always say, you got it wrong, you know, it was Albanian, not that. But it was, it's what drew me to this project, is to tell the story that Muslims saved Jews as well, and that that is unknown information, I think, pretty much in the United States. And I want to tell that story here. Um, it's common knowledge in Albania, no big deal. 
Anybody would do that, of course. But here, it's very, very important information to get out. And I will say it, but it largely goes unsaid in most of my presentations. But I'll tell you that in the neighborhood where I grew up, where people were knocking on doors asking for help and shelter, or giving them shelter was a capital offense, they would have had to knock on an awful lot of doors in that neighborhood. You only needed to knock on one in Albania. Is that pretty, does that maybe not answer it, but at least speak to your question? Okay. Any further, any other questions, please? All right, thank you. Thank you all for letting me come and talk.